Okay, hello and welcome to Thinkific Teach Online TV. This is the place to be if you want to learn how to create and sell online courses successfully. My name is Tyler Basu. I'm the content manager for Thinkific, and today I have the pleasure of speaking with somebody uh, that we've wanted to have on the show for a while now. So I'm very grateful that we finally uh, made this happen. This is Jeff Cobb, who's joining us from LearningRevolution.net. Uh, and he is an expert on global learning economy and the rapidly evolving market for lifelong learning, continuing education, and professional development. He's also the author of Leading the Learning Revolution, which is uh, being called the MBA in a book for anyone in the education business. So that is quite a compliment. And so he's been helping people cope from everyone, from consultants to trainers, speakers and experts, uh, create educational products, share their expertise, but more importantly, make sure their students are actually learning and applying the material, which is a big, uh, a big topic worth uh, touching on. And that's so that's going to be our focus today. So, Jeff, thank you so much for joining us. I'm excited to chat with you. Yeah, thanks so much for having me, Tyler. I'm looking forward to it. So Jeff, why don't you just take a moment to? Uh, I know I gave away a little bit of your, uh, you know, the, of your accolades there, but if you could just take a moment to tell us how you got into this space, you know, why you're in this space, and what you're focused on. Sure, I uh, I kind of fell into the world of online learning, online education, um, a good twenty years ago. At, at this point, I first got involved during the big dot com boom in the. Uh, in the mid '90s, uh, I was much younger back then, and um, got involved with a, a startup. And you know, we all thought we were going to make a gazillion dollars and, and change the world. And um, you know, I think we did some good things. We we didn't end up with the gazillion dollars in the end, but we learned a, a heck of a lot. And I sort of went on from there to uh, start a company of my own, which I ran for many years. And that that was an e-learning company. We actually had a a, a platform um, back in the early days of, of learning platforms, and um, would develop online courses as well. And I eventually sold that to another company, um, worked for them for a while. And then it's actually close to a decade. We're coming up on our, our 10th year right now. Uh, started a, a consulting business and um, work with, you know, different types of organizations. A lot of work with trade and professional organizations that are in the continuing education business. And so have been watching this whole world of online learning evolve now over the past decade. A, a huge amount has changed just in, in the last few years, you know, with, with platforms like Think if it coming along and just uh, a lot more, I think, of uh, what I describe as an entrepreneurial fever uh, out there around uh, online courses and online learning. And so, you know, I've continued to, to watch with curiosity, um, but then also, you know, continue to help organizations and experts, you know, with their with their strategy, with their marketing, with how they can get out there and actually uh, grow uh, an education business online. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right with uh, the online education really taking off these last few years. And I, in fact, I think it was uh, there was an article on Forbes, maybe even just two years back, that um, said that the online learning industry was a hundred billion dollar industry. And so, when numbers like that are thrown out there, uh, definitely a lot of entrepreneurs um, decide that hey, you know, if they've got expertise and 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 they want to you know create courses and. And, uh, and sell courses online and, and take advantage of that of that growing market. Um, but there's a scenario that we really want to help people avoid as course creators, and that's anyone who has who has expertise and you know they've they've been in in an industry or they've learned a skill set for many years and they're they're ready to share it with others, and they create a course. But the whole reason we create a course is because we want a student to actually learn what we're teaching them and apply what we're teaching them and get and and so that their lives are better because of it. And the big challenge that we're seeing is people creating courses, but not in a way that their students are actually completing the videos, applying the training and going off and getting the results that were promised. And so this is a big problem um, in the industry, I think. And I don't know what your thoughts on that. If you've noticed that trend as more people have created courses, have, have you noticed also the trend of the challenge uh, of students not completing and not grasping and not applying the knowledge also increasing? Or what are your, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think it's one of the most important challenges we have right now. And, uh, you know, it's, it's an educational challenge on the one hand. I mean, like you said, anybody who's teaching wants to actually create value, wants to create positive change for their, their learners. But it's also a business problem at this point. I mean, because of, you know, what's happened out there and it's become so much easier really for anybody, you know, that you can license a platform like Thinkific and be up and running with a, a course in, you know, no time flat. I mean, it used to take us 
weeks, months, even years, you know, to produce the, the types of courses that an individual expert can, can now produce on, on her own. But that means, you know, there's, there's so much stuff out there now. Um, there's a lot of noise. There's a lot of junk. Um, learner expectations have changed. I mean, it's so easy to, you know, sign up for one course one day and the next day, you know, you see another shiny object over here and you're going to go sign up for that instead. Um, so it's becoming, I mean, it's maturing as a business. It's like any other business. If you don't create high quality, if you don't produce the results that, you know, you promise to produce for your customers, then people aren't going to come or if they do come, they're not going to stay. And that's just the way any business matures and, you know, education, Lifelong learning, that is a business now, and, and the people who are in it who expect to succeed, you know, are going to have to be able to deliver value, and they're going to have to be able to deliver learning that keeps their learners around and ideally keeps them coming back for more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, ab absolutely. Um, there's, a, there's a couple of things that I wanted to touch on here, um, and of course, both of them are, help. Uh, you know, course creators uh, create courses that people, uh, you know, actually take and actually implement what they learn and helps, you know, helps that knowledge stick, as you put it, uh, with their students. But if we could break it up into two parts. So I've, I want to talk about content creation first. So in your experience, what are some of the ways that an online course creator can structure their content or create their content, uh, you know, whether that's video, audio, text, however they do it. But what are some of the ways that you found to be effective from the content creation point of view that keep the learners consuming that content, completing the lessons, going on to the next lessons? Like what are, what are a few tips um, that you found to be effective? Right. Well, and I would, I would even, I would step back even a little further from that because I think before before you start creating content, before you even start mapping out your content, I think you, you really have to make an effort to get into what I characterize as, as learner's mind and, and really understand the learner's perspective. Because you know, if, you're, if you're an expert teaching something, you've got so much more knowledge than probably you're ever really going to need to convey to your learner in the first place. And then you know, along with that, you've probably forgotten what it was like to, to be back there at, at the beginning and to be acquiring the skills and knowledge that you're now trying to, to help others uh, acquire. You know, a lot of people who are teaching just start talking about what they know. That's called, you know, declarative uh, knowledge. Um, they'll declare about everything they know, but, but really, you know, learning is a, is a process that takes place over time and you kind of have to take yourself back to the beginning. I was just recently teaching my uh, trying to teach my six-year-old daughter, for example, uh, how to ride a bike for the first time. And, you know, th that's, a, that's a great challenge for anybody who wants to get a perspective on teaching. I mean, you, you can't tell somebody uh, how to ride a bike. I mean, you can give them some basic instructions, but you have to really take yourself back to, you know, why was that difficult in, in the first place? Because you don't think about it in, anymore. It's just something that's, you know, in you at, at this point. And I really had to, you know, step back and say, okay, you know, what do I show her? What do I try to help her do that's going to get it started? And, you know, one of the things I discovered was, you know, so much is about how you just position yourself and your foot on the pedal initially just so you can get that initial push and get some momentum. And that's a very small thing, but it's, it's very key. And really only by coming coming back, you know, to that, that position as the, the learner. So I think when you're an expert and, and trying to teach people, you know, you need to think about what is that outcome that you're trying to produce for them? Where, where are they going to arrive? In most cases, you're going to need to narrow that down a lot. You're probably going to be trying to teach them much more than you realistically can in, in a course or a lesson. So really, really whittle it down, narrow it down to some very specific concrete things you can teach and then keep backing up from there into the processes, the experiences that, that you had to have as a learner to actually get to that point. And then, you know, as you start to put it together and you're going to teach with it, you know, chunk it out into whether it's individual videos or pieces of text or whatever it is you're putting it together, get it down into small digestible chunks that really scaffold the experience and get that learner from the point of, you know, putting her foot on the pedal and positioning correctly to then pushing and going and, and guiding the, the bike in, in this, this instance and successfully, you know, riding away uh, in, into the distance. Um, so, you know, first adopting that, uh, that learner's mind and working backward from there. And then I, I, it, you start to see what you need to do in terms of how to structure that experience in a way 
that's really going to connect with the learner and be meaningful. No, that that's really good advice, and you bring up a good point that the, you know if we are an expert in something, there's a chance we forgot what it's like to be a beginner. Um, so before we go and try to teach everything we know, we should really figure out okay, what's the specific outcome we want the person that we're teaching to be able to accomplish, and then from there work backwards and break it down into steps. Now, before we uh, create any content, actually, would you suggest maybe going out and speaking and or to some beginners or getting some feedback to some potential students and just like perhaps confirming with them what it is that they want to learn as as beginners, just so that you you know, you're, you're just better able to put yourself back in their shoes before you go and, cre and, and create this big course for them? Oh, absolutely. I mean, one of the, the concepts that I use a lot in the uh, Leading the Learning Revolution, and it's not a, original to me, but it's the idea of a, of a minimum viable product. Um, and I'm a big fan of, you know, test driving your material. So you can, you, you can run a pilot um, I mean, in the first place, you know, you should be you should be building your audience. You should be communicating with your learners, you know, blogging, seeing what the feedback is on that, building an email list, having conversations with those learners. So you really should be in touch with your learners before you're ever putting a course out there. But then also, you know, to be, before you record video, you know, commit things to a more of a fixed format. You know, oftentimes to, to run some form of a pilot, um, I mean, even doing something like what we're doing right now, you can use Skype, you can use Zoom, you can use, you know, those sorts of tools and, you know, flesh out your curriculum, find a, a small target group of learners and take them through a pilot. Um, take them, you know, through that sort of minimum viable product that you think is going to help them achieve the outcomes that you think they want to achieve. And you're going to learn, you know, at least two things in the process. One is whether that outcome is really what they want. Uh, or not, and then two, whether you really have gotten into that learner's mind and understand, you know, how to walk them through the processes that they're going to need to get there. But you know, you have to interact with actual learners to figure that out. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I'm I'm so glad you brought that up in the concept of minimum viable product, or in this case, minimum viable course. Um, you know, I've had the privilege of speaking to a lot of course creators and the ones that are doing well never created a perfect course the first time. It was always minimum viable course. They got feedback. Uh, they were open to feedback. They made changes to their content. They improved their content over time. And now you look at them and you, and you say, wow, they've got a great course, a great program and all these great uh, testimonials from students that are, that are doing well. But it didn't start out there. They worked up to that level by iterating and improving and getting feedback uh, from their students. So let's say we've uh, we've gone through that process. Um, we've talked to some beginners. We we know the steps that they want to learn, and so we're ready to create our content. Do you have any tips on creating content that actually gets consumed? Well, I think you want to plan for a number of things um, as you're putting your your content uh, together, so that you're going to in, engage the the learners in a way that they are, are likely to learn and that they'll recognize um, that they're actually learning. So. You know, uh, some core principles. Um, one is to give opportunities for uh, effort for re effortful retrieval. Basically, um, I call this kind of playing fetch uh, with learning. So, you know, as you're creating the the content that, that you're creating, you know, figure out the ways in which uh, you're going to make sure the students are recalling it throughout the course. And one of the, the simplest ways of doing this is by just in using quizzing thoughtfully throughout the course, and I prefer not to think of it as quizzing, more as just self-testing, you know, for adult learners in particular, to be able to kind of self-check and to be able to self-test uh, throughout a course. You want to provide, you know, those opportunities, um, but even more effective than uh, just the, the traditional quizzing. I mean, I think you should use that, uh, the kind of multiple choice type stuff. Um, you know, asking reflective questions, um, you know, and, and making it clear that you do expect them to engage on those and, and, uh, and spend the time reflecting, um, asking short answer type questions that are spaced out among the content. You know, so if you if you run a video, um, you know, following that video, ask, a, you know, two or three short questions where the learner has to, in you know, his own words, uh, convey what's been learned, you know, to, to, to show that um, they've actually grasped that knowledge. And, uh, 
you know, before people get scared and think, well, you know, that means I'm going to have to look at all this stuff and grade it. Uh, you don't necessarily even have to do that. If you can just en encourage the learners to go through that process on their own and actually take the time, you know, to write out the short answers, to, to journal out the, the short answers, um, to actually en engage, you know, with, with their, their own minds. I mean, they have to take responsibility for their own learning. So, you know, definitely provide um, a frequent uh, instances throughout any course for effort, for retrieval, for people to bring back the knowledge that uh, that, uh, that you've been teaching them. Um, another one of those is, uh, or another key practice is to, you know, to, to help them forge the connections, to connect the learning back to how it applies in their life. I mean, learning really is about creating neural connections, basically. You know, you're wiring your brain together when you're learning something. So, you know, as you're putting that together the content, you, again, uh, video is so common now. People are shooting videos and, and putting those together into courses. But make, make sure that, you know, in the context of those videos or supporting those videos, that you are creating meaningful activities. You know, those might be worksheets, um, assignments that you're giving the learners to, you know, to, again, get them to connect it back into what they're doing in, in their work, what they're doing in, in, in their life, uh, to help them, what in learning theory is called, elaborate on what you've been teaching them and, uh, and, and, and figure out how it connects into uh, their life. And again, you know, having them uh, engage and bringing that back to you, it's, it's funny, you know, one of the things I've read about recently that's, that's very powerful um, in, in working with learners is to ask them to predict what they're gonna do with um, what you're teaching them. You know, so, you know, maybe you've just done a video uh, that they've gone through and you're asking them and you may be doing this live or again, it may just be you're asking them to journal about it in some way, but to predict, OK, I'm going to take this knowledge now and, you know, three weeks from now or six months from now or one year from now, this is what I'm going to be able to do with it. But that that helps to form those connections that cements uh, the, the learning. And at the same time, you know, it's helping the learner see the, the possibilities uh, that are coming out of the, the, the learning. And that's that's something that helps keep them engaged in, in whatever you're teaching. Mm, OK, no, that, that's some that's some great advice. I appreciate that. Um, now, another thing that uh, you, you actually you touched on this a little bit already um, and you mentioned this in your book as well. But because there is so much information out there and not just in the form of courses i mean any topic that somebody wants to learn they've got a lot of options i mean they can watch videos on youtube they can read blogs they can buy books they can take courses there's lots of stuff that they can do um so standing out um among the those other resources is one challenge but and there's no shortage of information um, we know that Absolutely no shortage. So the value in an online course is not necessarily just in the information. Um, it's also in, you know, the community that you create around that course and you as the instructor making yourself accessible to your students, letting the students access each other. Uh, and these things happen naturally in a classroom environment. I mean, a lot of people will take a course at a college or a university, for example, uh, not just for the information, but also to meet with uh, with students who are also learning that same topic, to have access to an instructor who's an expert on that topic. So what are some of the ways that we can mimic that real world classroom environment in an online setting so that our students aren't just getting information, uh, which may not be as valuable anymore since there's so much of it, but they're also getting the, that chance to interact with us as the instructor or even other students who are taking the course. Right. Well, you know, some of uh, what I was just referring to in terms of the types of activities uh, that you give them, getting them to, you know, make predictions, tell stories that uh, you know, bring in the elements of what you're teaching uh, along with what they already know. I mean, those are things that can and should certainly be shared, whether that's in the context of a, you know, a discussion board or a Facebook group. Um, I think in, in most instances now, it's very powerful to be able to have, you know, at least some form of um, live uh, interaction when, you, when you're teaching a course. So whether that's, you know, an office hours type uh, scenario um, or just, you know, some group coaching, that sort of thing. But, uh, you know, alongside, you know, say a platform like Thinkific to be able to use Zoom or, or, or something like that to, you know, help people see each other um, and actually, you know, hear about and, and engage with uh, uh, each other's issues and challenges and opportunities that uh, are connected to that learning experience. I mean, the the, uh, the capabilities for doing that now is just, is just so much easier than, than it ever has been before. So, you know, definitely baking that in. Again, you know, baking it in in a way, though, that it, that it 
does really tie into the progression of learning that that it is meaningful. You know that you're not. That we've, I'm sure I've been to conferences where you have somebody who's leading the, the 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 classroom and they'll say, okay, we discuss this among yourselves, sort of thing, and it's not really clear what you're supposed to be doing or what you're supposed to be getting out of it. So. You know, you really have to tie in, okay, we're, we're trying to progress to this outcome, and here's how having everybody share and interact at this point, you know, is actually meaningful to do. But, you know, use Facebook, use discussion boards, use Zoom, bake them into your overall uh, learning strategy throughout the course. Yeah, yeah. And I think that having those, uh, those environments and those capabilities built in, you know, whether it's a discussion board or a forum or a private Facebook group for your students, um, they help add to the value of their course. And a lot of times we'll see an online course um, that would be considered like a high ticket course or a higher price. And usually it's because there's a community component attached to it. Um, the inexpensive courses and, and courses that you find, you know, often in marketplaces and such, that are in, in that lower price range, um, it's just not built into that instructor's model. Like they can't afford to give attention to every one of their students, especially if they've got hundreds or thousands of them. Um, when it's if, if it's just not a part of of the model. So uh, I don't know. In, in your experience, have you seen that when if somebody's you know buying a course and the price is higher? Is there that expectation that they're getting more than just information, that there's going to be some some community element attached to the course to some extent? I think definitely that that's more and more true now. I mean, we used to you know live in the age of the information product where, you know, you had some special or secret information that uh, you were going to charge a premium for. But, uh, I, you know, we just all know that's not true these days with what you, know, you can go out on Google and find just about anything so you know just just having the, the information doesn't do it anymore and I think even you know this kind of relates to what I was just saying um, say saying you have the community and really having the community and, and really have a community having a community that is helping to facilitate uh, learning those are two different things I mean anybody can throw up a Facebook page or a discussion board it's kind of like what, what I was saying about the instructor in a, in a conference session saying, you know, talk among yourselves sort of thing, that doesn't accomplish anything. I mean, if you're gonna be effective as a teacher, you, again, you need to have thought through why this is important and then you need to be there. You know, it, it's gonna be a little bit of a time commitment. It's certainly gonna be a thought commitment uh, on your part is, you know, how am I really gonna be able to spark engagement here? And, and how can I, you know, leverage the community effectively? I mean, like you said, you know, if you got if you got thousands of students and some of these um, high end courses, they they still get thousands of students in them. You're not going to be able to you know communicate with every single student in in the course, but you can strategically think about okay, how do we leverage that community in a way that's powerful for everybody? You know, so something even like you know a virtual hot seat or, or something like that, where you know you get somebody and maybe you can do this in a discussion environment as well. You could certainly do it with something like Skype or, or Zoom. Where you get you know the one or two or three learners you know to really go through their particular situation you know say what their challenges are get everybody to contribute their input they might be contributing out through text you know to to keep it uh, under control but then everybody's learning in the process because you know they're able to connect that back to their own situation and think about how that you know what they would do in the same situation or how theirs is a little bit different so you know being able to to leverage the community, the participants in the community in, in a way that uh, is, is going to, you know, you may be focusing on a particular learner or a particular situation, but you've thought about how that's actually going to, you know, ripple out across the community. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, that's some great points. Have you, um, have there been any scenarios where you as the instructor or perhaps other online course uh, creators that you know of where they're proactively reaching out to students that perhaps aren't aren't completing videos, aren't completing trainings, aren't doing the assignments? Like, are there ways that we can proactively uh, support those people and help increase our completion rates um, by, by, by reaching out to those students in some way? Yeah, it's a, um, it's a, it's a fine line, I think. In fact, I was talking to somebody yesterday who's a, a coach in a, a, a popular program, and she was saying, you know, how they used to do a lot more of that, and um, you know, when they they're now on version three of uh, of their this particular course, and it's very successful. Um, it gets you know rave reviews. It's in it's a top dollar course, and they've they've cut back on that uh, quite a bit 
because you know they felt increasingly that um, the the learners who were going to take responsibility, you know, the, the ones who were going to be successful were going to have that certain level of commitment and motivation and responsibility in themselves to participate. You know, those who weren't weren't. Um, but you got to figure out where that line is, you know, for you personally and for your group of learners. A lot of it comes back to setting expectations both during your sales process um, and then as students are initially kind of getting indoctrinated into the course experience, you know, to make it clear that uh, there'll be some hand holding, there'll be some nudging. You want to design your learning in a way that you're helping to, to nudge people along, but, um, but you know, that they are going to be expected to, to, to take responsibility for, for their own learning, that that's really the only way that learning is going to truly happen in the end. So, you know, I, like I said, it, it depends on the individual and structure. It depends on your group and what your goals are, sort of where you put that line. But I can say my bias is more towards not doing too much of the uh, kind of nagging, I guess you could put it, uh, to, to get students interested. Right. No, no, that, that makes sense. And I think um, the price of a course also helps uh, qualify people up front. Like I personally, if I spend, you know, a thousand dollars or more on a course, I'm going to take it. Like, you don't need to remind me to take it. Um, you, you know, I've, uh, but if I get a course for like $50, then it's probably, it could end up sitting on my virtual bookshelf, um, among many other courses that I bought inexpensively and haven't gotten around to taking yet. So I think, uh, just pricing a course higher up front probably helps. Um, you, you mentioned, you know, having some of those expectations in the sales process and trying to qualify people before they get in so that perhaps that that doesn't happen or at least it helps minimize it. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's really up to each instructor to decide how feasible it is for them to uh, to become that accountability partner, I guess, for their students. Right. Um, you've been sharing a lot of good stuff. I really appreciate this. Um, is there anything that we haven't touched on yet? Uh, any mistakes to avoid? Any other tips that come to mind? Anything that um, course creators can do to help their students really grasp and apply their material? Well, I would just uh, I'd probably go back to what I was you know, saying in, in the first place, uh, just about um, you know, how critical this is now and really thinking about your course, not just as an educational vehicle, um, but as a business. And, and, you know, people come from different angles. Some, some people are coming from a business angle and see this as a money-making opportunity. And, you know, they probably need to learn a little bit more about the, the educational side of things. And the people coming from the educational side of things need to learn uh, more about the business. It's both at this point, and, and you have to balance those. And you just really, you really have to be thinking about that from the beginning as you're as you're architecting the whole experience. And uh, you know, it's all it's all thinking strategically, basically about um, how you're going to to create your course, and then making sure that you know as you as you create the content, as you sequence the content, as you think about the activities that go in to get people to apply the content, as you think about where you'll repeat concepts across it, that all of it is aligned with you know reaching that ultimate outcome uh, for the learner. Yeah, no, that that's actually a really good point. And I, I was just having a conversation with some colleagues the other day um, because we hear the, you know, the encouragement. There's a lot of encouragement happening online where, where anybody can teach online, anybody can make courses, things like that. And we thought about it and we're like, well, no, that's not actually true because it there's a few different skill sets it takes to do this successfully. Number one is you do need an ex you need expertise. First of all, you do need to add, you need competence in whatever it is that you plan to share with others. Um, then you need to know how to teach that, which is another skill set, being able to teach something to others and transfer knowledge. And then on top of that, you need to know how to build a brand and build a, a business and, and, you know, wrap your courses into a business model and then get out there and promote yourself and market yourself and and things like that. So that's three different skill sets right there. And I'm sure there are, within each of those, there are many more. Um, but I am curious uh, because you're somebody who, who has built a business by sharing your knowledge. Uh, is there any uh, anything in particular that's been helpful for you in terms of learning how to transfer what you know to others? Is uh, anything that you'd like to recommend? And I, know, and I know you have a ton of resources as well, but for somebody who has expertise, but they're not quite good at teaching their expertise just yet, where, where are some ways we can learn to become better teachers? Mm. 
Well, um, you know, I think in so many ways, you know, being a, being an effective learner and um, and being an effective teacher, I mean, they're two sides of the same coin. And I think in, in so many instances, you know, if if you're going to make progress in whatever you're doing, um, you have to know yourself well. And I think, you know, one of the, the ways that, that I've come to be a, a better teacher and to be more effective as a teacher has been simply through becoming a better learner um, and, and understanding what my own learning in, involves. Um, you know, so, you know, I, I understand now that if I'm truly going to uh, master something, I'm going to have to methodically repeat it and practice it in a meaningful way uh, over time, for example. That's just one example of, uh, you know, how to be a, an effective learner. Um, and so, you know, I think anybody who's really serious about being successful as a teacher and, and helping others learn should step back and look at their own learning practices, look at where they struggle um, as a learner, look at where they struggled as they were trying to learn uh, what they know right now um, and, and try to have that inform how they approach their, their teaching of others. I mean, in so many ways, this traces back to my original point about learner's mind. I mean, that applies at both a very specific and a very general level. And, and I think the people who do manage to master those different skills or at least become very competent in those different skills that you just talked about for being in the online course business are excellent learners. Um, you know, they have to be um, and then they, they start to realize, you know, how to take that excellence in learning and transform it into how they're actually teaching their students. Yeah. Okay. No, th those are some great suggestions. Thanks for sharing that. So, Jeff, I just have one last question for you and then we'll wrap up. Um, if we could, you know, inspire those who are in that process of creating courses or they're thinking of making a course and they want to be successful at building a business around sharing their knowledge, but they also want their students to succeed, of course, by applying that knowledge. But I'm just curious, what kind of an impact has you sharing your knowledge and having people who are learning from you and applying what you teach, what kind of an impact has that had on your life and business? Um, and you know, what are, what are some of the things that, you're, that you enjoy now um, that you didn't enjoy before you were, you were sharing your knowledge with others? Oh boy, that's a... <laughs> An interesting question. Um, you know, I think that uh, as as our business has grown, one of the things that um, that I've had to do more and more is um, you know is actually be up on a stage in in, in front uh, of people. And um, you know, even though I've been teaching for a long time, it's sort of it's one thing to be in a, a small classroom with you know 10 or 15 people and that's kind of how I started out teaching in, in graduate school many years ago or even being in an online environment because you you have a little bit of shelter in an online environment you know you're just in your office with your computer or whatever the case might be but that you know actually have to be up on a stage and in, in front of a lot of people and I actually just went through a, um, a training experience myself uh, a few weeks ago and this was with Michael Port who's well known as a um, uh, sort of the, the, yeah, the yeah, trainer yeah. Of, of, of speakers. Heroic and it public was, speaking, right? Yeah, yeah, nice. heroic public speaking. And I did a master class with that. And, uh, you know, so I got up on stage in front of this auditorium of other speakers and just kind of got put through my paces for an hour or so. And I have to say, it was just the most thrilling experience in, in the world. Um, you know, and I've realized that uh, I I like, um, you know, being up on the, on the stage like that. I like... Uh, performing uh, in, in a way, um, something I would never really have thought about uh, as part of my life before. Um, and, uh, and, I, and I also really liked, and it kind of goes back to what I was saying earlier about, you know, teaching and learning being two sides of the same coin, being able to kind of almost step back and have this meta perspective on witnessing how he was doing what he was doing and how I was learning in the process. And, and I realized that I'm now able to do that. Um, and I don't ever I think I've thought of that as a, a skill before, but I walked out of there just, you know, uh, really amazed on, on multiple levels. It was a fantastic learning experience, but it was also this fantastic way for me to be able to step back and, and see somebody else who was really an expert at their craft and, and how that actually worked. And, you know, I think having the ability to, to do that now obviously is very helpful in, in my business, but it's also just personally very rewarding to, to kind of see those dynamics at work and be able to recognize them at work. 
Mm. Okay, no, that, that's great. Well, Jeff, thank you so much again. I really appreciate your time today and for sharing your insights with us. Um, now, I'll recommend your book if anyone wants to grab your book, Leading the Learning Revolution. That is on Amazon. Um, and if anyone wants to get in touch with you, learningrevolution.net is uh, your home base online, correct? Is, is that the that best That is place? correct, yeah. That's, okay. that's the place to find me, yeah, definitely. Perfect. So I will, I will link to that below the video. And if anyone has questions for Jeff or wants to get in touch with him or take advantage of any of the great resources that he's put together, please do. Uh, Jeff, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, thank you, Tyler. Enjoy talking with you.